It's a different kind of holocaust which is even more terrifying than the destruction of people. Often death can be merciful. There is a nuclear bombing of the African brain. That kind of holocaust, the mental holocaust that occurred, whereby many people who were, many Africans who were colonized were actually had their African character almost zapped away from them and something else planted upon their brains. Which was? Uh, which, is the, the, which is a kind of duplication of the European. They were turned into European duplicates. I could say that by, at the time I was 24, with the exception of an interval during our upheaval and the death of my father, I was a European duplicate. I was a British um, duplicate. Everything that the British wanted me to think, I could enter their brain, every reflex, every attitude, every prejudice that was native to the British Empire was in my brain. And it occupied at least 95% of my brain. It is so only in later years as one became aware of African civilizations and American civilizations that this began to fall away. Did you love England at that time? Tremendously. I would celebrate. I mean, like now, for example, suppose I was still in the British Empire, which is which no longer exists except in the mind of the British. And the Falkland Islands thing was going on. I would be waiting patiently every moment to see an Argentine ship go down. This is the kind of loyalty, allegiance to the, 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 um, the enslaver that became part of our inheritance. You sang God Save the Queen. Not only sang God Save the Queen, I felt proud that I was in an empire which was able to put everybody in their right place, including the Americans. I was very upset when I read that Americans had broken away from British rule. This is the kind of training we were given. Not a single book on Africa did I see before I was 20, not a single book. So we're talking about the evils of the colonization of the mind as well as of land and we're body. We're talking about the rise of the evil genius of Europe and Western racism, there wasn't enough soldiers in all Europe to hold down that vast world. They had to conquer something else other than just the physical body. They had to conquer the mind. And maybe their most tragic and dubious achievement was the convincing of so many people that they were supposed to be ruled over by these Europeans. It was one of the great propaganda miracles. In what the was the great world. What, what was the most effective vehicle for that propaganda? The Bible and the assumption that the European was a Christian. He never was a Christian, he never will be a Christian. And there are two things the European dares not live by. If he tried to live by them twenty four hours, he is finished. And that is Christianity and democracy because his civilization, his way of life, his power is based on things diametrically, compo diametrically opposed to those two things. How does the Bible help enslave the mind? I'm asking... By, by, by saying that this is the will of God. There's an excellent book, good God, I haven't seen it in years though, except a Zorak's copy in my library, called The Role of the Missionary in, um, in Conquest. A lot of the land was taken from the African um, uh, with the missionary going ahead of the colonizer and telling them it is the will of God that we uh, uh, control this land. A lot of the land, the Kenyan highlands, uh, the, a lot of land in Uganda was taken over by the church. Uh, in fact, the Catholic Church had title over most of the land surface of uh, Uganda and hasn't relinquished it completely to this, uh, to this very day. Christianity was an instrument of um, of colonial, the handmaiden of colonialism. And I can remember as a little boy um, wanting to teach the junior class in Sunday school. And I, I began to look into the great book, trying to find my own people. And I didn't see that image nowhere. I tried to find the word Negro. And it wasn't in the Bible. I didn't know there was no such thing as a Negro, you know. And I, and I looked at the Sunday school lesson, look at all these images. And all these images told me that I was nothing. I was outside of everything in the world, that all the achievement in the world was done by, um, by white people. I go to the basic history books and I see nothing but white images. I see nothing that endears me to myself uh, or to my own people.
Professor Ben, what do you have to say about the missionary position? I should say the practice of missionaries. Well, wow. uh, I don't have anything good to say, so I could make it by that one statement. And I don't think anyone who knows their African history could uh, uh, compliment the missionaries. First thing is that the, pres the assumption is made by Europeans, uh, Billy Graham and others, and I noticed that he's getting his lumps now, uh, for having the courage to say that somebody has uh, practiced Christianity, but I don't know what he meant by that either. But number one, Christianity started in Africa at a place called Alexandria with two people, Tantius and Botius. It spread across the North African continent. There were seven patriarchs, equivalent to the word Pope, 27 bishops before it arrived in Europe. An African by the name of Augustine who made modern Christianity, the, the basis for his, his writing, Europeans copied. Augustine's books are called, some of them, of the 40 ad books, the confession that tells you who he was, and Christian doctrines, they laid down the fundamentals of modern Christianity, and the other one called uh, the, um, the, um, the Holy City of God. It is not only the Bible, Christian Bible, however, the Old Testament, or the Torah, as it is called, speak, speaks of chosen people. A God made a world full of people and select a handful to be the special ones. The Koran and Islam, equally, the jihads were brought. Although Ben Havid and Hadset Kubadi Ben Rabad taught Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, who was illiterate in his own language, the fundamentals of uh, the, the religions that, upon, the, the fundamentals were upon which both, all three got their <laughs> beginning, we were told, and still being told, that there's a holy land for us in Palestine or, uh, or Jerusalem. There's a holy land for us in Bethlehem. There's a holy land for us in Mecca. But not a single piece of holy land in the 13 point add million square miles of African territory. Yet, all three of those religions that I've spoken about got their fundamental principles. The concept of Mary, Jesus, and Joseph, this whole concept came from the Book of the Dead with Horus and so forth. The concept of a one true God before all other gods was taught by the Africans of the Nile, Akhenaten, specifically the god Atem, long before the birth of Moses. Let me ask you this, Professor Ben. Were you, like uh, Professor Van Sertema, raised with another awareness and another religious loyalty and national loyalty? Yes. Where I, were you raised? I was raised in the Hebrew religion. What, what na nation? I grew up in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Uh -huh. And uh, I was raised, in, therefore, in American territory. But mm -hmm. the same colonialism. Mm -hmm. I remember myself as a, as a youngster on the 4th of July, walking with a red, white, and a little flag with the, what it was then, 40-something stars, and running down there when Eleanor Roosevelt came and all these different things, and, uh, you know, I volunteered in World War II, you know. Nobody called me. I volunteered. I was so stupid. I went and volunteered, went to Panama to a segregated army where I couldn't go on the bus with the American <laughs> people, and in Panama, I went to the Panamanians. I could go around. I came to Newport News, Virginia in the service and couldn't go on the ferry. They had a line called nigger, the nigger officers and the white officers. That happened to me. And do you know it was a German soldier that I was guarding, officer, that asked me, nigger, he says, exact word he said to me, nigger officer, do you know that when this is over, I'm coming to America and be your boss? Mm -hmm. And then I started for the first <laughs> time to get some sense, although I had been segregated in Panama. And so forth, and in the, I didn't even recognize I was being segregated in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. I didn't even realize it. I thought that everything was, as they say, hunky dory down there. But, you know, because hunky, of what he said, hunky dory, hunky -dory, -dory -K -K -Y. That, that was right. the expression. Right. That okay. means real good. <laughs> and then I was a perfect fool and didn't know it. I, I you know, I, I used the term Negro then. Colored was a big thing, you know. And, and Africa so was not on your lips. What are you talking about, Africa? Africa is where Tarzan and Jane was, and, uh, you know, the Humphrey Bogart. I used to go to see uh, John Wayne and Tom Mix and Roddy Regan 
and all of them <laughs> shooting up the indigenous people. And I used to say, hey, there's a savage coming to shoot them comics. And then with the African, I'd say, oh, look at them savage. Tarzan is coming. And I'm hoping for Tarzan. And Tarzan hollering, Ungawa. And one thing, I didn't know that Ungawa mean dudu. Because I, when, every time Tarzan said Ungawa, and when I found out that Ungawa meant dudu, I said, Ungawa Tarzan. <laughs> I used to have fun then. But you wouldn't believe that this person, because I, what I know wasn't taught to me in school. I look back and sometimes I say, how in the world did I come this far from where I was? It's, it's over miracles. That's a miracle. Tell me about your upbringing, John. No, I had suspicion from the beginning. When I, couldn't find, when I couldn't find my people in the good book, and my great grandmother had told me that this was the book of God, this was the word of God. But where were you raised? I was raised in, uh, born in Union Springs, Alabama, raised in Columbus, Georgia, uh, near Fort Benning. Uh, you know, and I mm -hmm. made my living part as a caddy. Mm -hmm. Used to caddy for a major who later became a general and later became president of the United States. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was a lost cause then, too. Uh, be that as it may, be that as it may, but growing up in a predominantly Baptist environment and um, becoming very curious about the Bible, uh, I began to suspect very early. How early? At, uh, 10 and 12, that I did not belong to any people who were inferior to anybody. Mm -hmm. So then about 1930... But in your schooling up to then, though, wasn't the reverse implied? The reverse was Im implied, but I can say with great conviction, I never completely accepted it. Or were you going to a black school and were you getting... I was going to a black school where the teachers would sneak in. Black history, they could sneak it into mathematics, they could sneak it into anything. But it was in the fifth grade that... Um, I ran into a great teacher, who, Evelina Taylor, who was a, a deity to me to this day. Uh, when she saw me cutting the food and trying to get accepted by playing the food, and she called me aside and closed the door and read the riot act and told me that I'll never let you be less than your best self. You are going to get it. Gentlemen, it's obvious that we can't uh, unveil the whole story of our uh, 